Greetings to you all. I'm Honorable Dr. Eliezer Mbuki Falesh, the principal judge of the High Court of Tanzania. It's my pleasure to share with you some key issues that you ought to pay attention to in the handling of cases involving children in juvenile courts. This teaching tool will give you the best knowledge required in such cases. I therefore urge you to not only be attentive to what is being taught, but to are there to read in the execution of your duties. I wish you all the best as you learn. This teaching tool is intended to provide knowledge and skills on how to properly handle cases involving children to the following juvenile justice frontline workers. Resident magistrates, state attorneys and public prosecutors, social welfare officers and private legal practitioners. This teaching tool covers different topics on criminal charges against children in conflict with the law as well as civil applications and child protection cases involving children. In the criminal charges, the following topics will be covered. Introduction Jurisdiction of the Juvenile Court Criminal charges against children Composition of the Juvenile Court Sitting arrangement Speaking to children Age determination Do's and don'ts in the juvenile court The social inquiry report And sentences In civil applications, the following topics will be covered Introduction Jurisdiction of the Juvenile Court in Civil Applications and Child Protection Cases and Mode of Presenting an Application Jurisdiction of the Juvenile Court The Juvenile Court is a specialized court that hears and determines cases involving children. This is according to Section 97, Subsection 1 of the Law of the Child Act. According to Section 97, Subsection 2 of the Law of the Child Act, as amended by Written Laws Miscellaneous Amendment Act No. 1 of 2020, a district court premises or a court of resident magistrate premises may be used as a juvenile court. It should be noted that the juvenile courts have their own procedure to adjudicate cases. According to the Law of the Child Act, Cap 13, Revised Edition of 2019, a child is regarded as any person below the age of 18 years. Section 99 of the Law of the Child Act provides that the procedure in operating juvenile courts shall be in accordance with the juvenile court rules. This is provided under Government Notice No. 182 of 2016. The Juvenile Court has jurisdiction over criminal cases against a child over the minimum age of criminal responsibility. This is provided under Section 98, Subsection 1A of the Law of the Child Act. The Juvenile Court also has jurisdiction over committal proceedings in relation to offences for which the High Court has original jurisdiction. This is according to Section 103 of the Law of the Child Act, Cap 13, Revised Edition of 2019. Civil and Child Protection Applications Relating to a Child These include Parentage, Custody, Access, Maintenance and Child Protection Cases This is provided under Section 98, Subsection 1B of the Law of the Child Act 
and Rule 3 of the Juvenile Court Rules, which defines child care applications. Criminal Charge Against the Child The procedure for conducting proceedings by the juvenile courts in all matters shall be according to the Juvenile Court Rules as made under Section 99, Subsection 1 of the Law of the Child Act, but under the following conditions. The juvenile court sits as often as necessary. Proceedings shall be held in camera. This is also provided under Rule 11, Subrule 1 of the Juvenile Court Rules. When we talk of camera proceedings, it is specifically meant that uh, proceedings are not open for the public to see, but it's still even for the media to report. That is strictly forbidden and magistrate or judges should adhere to this particular principle. Proceedings shall be informal as possible and made by inquiry without exposing the child to adversarial procedures. Rule 8 of the Juvenile Court Rules supports this. And here we want to insist that because the child is as young as he is or she is, that means the proceedings should be as simple as necessary and should subject not to him uh, those intricate proceedings that we have in normal adult courts. A social welfare officer shall be present. This is also stipulated under Rule 11, Subrule 3C of the Juvenile Court Rules. The unreported case of Furaha Johnson versus Republic, Criminal Appeal Number 452 of 2015, illustrates this. In this particular case, a district court in Arusha just had a juvenile, a juvenile court case. By its sitting, there was no social welfare officer. Of course, the Republic won the case. When it went to the Court of Appeal, the proceedings were nullified, or the appeal was allowed, simply because the social welfare officer was not present and, and not take part in the proceedings. So it is important that this thing should be heard to by judges and magistrates when it happens that they hear juvenile court cases. A right of a parent, guardian or next of kin to be present. This is also pointed out in Rule 11, Subrule 3D and E of the Juvenile Court Rules. Another condition, the child shall have a right to legal representation by an advocate, guardian ad litem or paralegal. It should be noted that in law, a child has no capacity to sue and therefore a child must have a next friend to assist him or her. This is also supported under Rule 11 Subrule 3B of the Juvenile Court Rules and Sections 19, 20 and 35 of the Legal Aid Act. The right to appeal shall be explained to the child. This is also supported under Section 130 of the Law of the Child Act and Rule 123, Subrule 1, and the child shall have a right to give an account and express an opinion. Section 11 of the Law of the Child Act also supports this. Composition of the Juvenile Court The proceedings in juvenile court should be held in camera, that is, in private, with the aim of maintaining confidentiality. Rule 11 of the Juvenile Court Rules stipulates the personnel who are allowed to attend the juvenile court as follows. Resident Magistrate Responsible for leading proceedings Clerks Responsible for administration. Public prosecutors. They are responsible for prosecuting cases and delivering sufficient evidence or appropriate cases to court. 
advocates. They are responsible for representing children. Social welfare officer. Responsible for supporting children, including conducting a social inquiry report. And guardian ad litem or paralegals responsible for supporting and representing children. So, are there any other people allowed to attend juvenile court proceedings? The answer is yes. The following persons may also attend juvenile court proceedings. Parents, guardians or carer, interns or researchers, consultants, and any other person that the magistrate considers appropriate in the particular circumstances of a child or necessary for effective delivery of justice. Here is something to note. With exception of parents, guardians or carers, other persons such as interns, researchers and consultants should attend upon discretion of the magistrate and after obtaining a consent from the child. This is well provided under Rule 11, Sub Rule 4 of the Juvenile Court Rules. Non-appearance of parties or witness. Under Rule 38, Sub Rule 1, where the prosecutor fails to appear before the court on the date fixed for hearing and has not informed the court of his inability to attend, the court shall fix another date and inform the prosecutor of his failure to attend. Under Rule 38, Sub Rule 2, if the prosecutor fails to appear before the court on another date fixed for hearing, and has not informed the court of his inability to attend, the case shall be dismissed. Under Rule 38, Sub Rule 3, where a social welfare officer responsible for the first assessment report or the social inquiry report fails to attend a fixed hearing and has not informed the court of his inability to attend, the court shall summon the said officer or the head of the social welfare department to provide an explanation for non-attendance. Under Rule 38, Sub Rule 4, where a witness for the prosecution including a child witness or defense fails to attend court without good cause in response to a summons, the court shall a. Dispense with that witness and continue with proceedings or issue a warrant to bring him before the court at such a time and place as shall be specified in the warrant. Sitting Arrangement In juvenile court proceedings, there is a required sitting arrangement. Rule 7 of the Juvenile Court Rules states that in order to promote an informal, child-friendly environment that facilitates maximum participation by the child, all parties shall sit on the same level and the child shall not be placed in a dock or other raised structure. The proper sitting arrangement is as follows. Rule 7, Sub Rule 2 of the Juvenile Court Rules stipulates that the magistrate shall sit at the head of the table and the court clerk shall sit close to the magistrate. The public prosecutor shall sit to the right of the magistrate. The defense advocate, or in the absence of an advocate, a guardian ad litem shall sit to the left of the magistrate. The child shall sit beside his advocate or guardian ad litem in order to communicate with him. The social welfare officer shall sit at the end of the table, opposite the magistrate, save where the child does not have a parent. 
the social welfare officer shall take the seat of a parent. For example, in sexual offences, most of the time you will find that children who are abused, they fail to give evidence in court because they are scared of looking at the accused person. And sometimes they cry. So the court must take action to alter the sitting arrangement to facilitate the giving of evidence of the child witness. Underpinning Principles In the hearing and determination of children's cases, the following are the underpinning principles. That is to say, the best interest of the child shall be at the primary consideration. And here, we mean that in all activities that a juvenile court does, it has to aim at securing the best interest of the child. That is the key and very important thing to adhere when we are hearing cases against children. Another point here is that every child shall be treated with respect and without discrimination of any kind. Discrimination here may mean that if you have a child brought before the court and happens that he is the so-called street children as we have them, by the fact that they come from the streets is not the fact that they have committed offenses. Therefore, the court should take them as normal offenders who are not yet proven guilty by any court. Therefore, if a feeling comes that such a particular child, because he comes from certain or such and such conditions, is an offender, that in the eyes of the law is discrimination of its own kind. Therefore, we should as a matter of law and as a matter of fact, give every child a right to be represented and to participate in the proceedings and to be heard either directly or through an advocate or through a guardian litem or any other sort of representation that can be secured in the courtroom. Speaking to children. Now, what are good question techniques when in juvenile proceedings? As per Rule 45, Sub Rule 4, and 45, Sub Rule 6 of the Juvenile Court Rules, in cross examination, one should use simple, appropriate language that the child can understand, avoid leading questions. Avoid complex compound questions. That is, one should ask one question at a time. When questions are compounded, it means one asks one more than one question into one. Or the one may narrate a sentence, or a particular paragraph, or narrate something. Then at the end of the day, makes a question. That is too technical for the child to answer. At the end of the day, <coughs> The child may simply answer in a way the question has been asked instead of taking into account the consequences of answering the particular question. Therefore, compounded questions are not allowed in the juvenile court proceedings. Do not use aggressive, confrontational or degrading language. Do not repeat the same question over and over again it could confuse the child, avoid irrelevant questions and needless repetition. Avoid using questions that involve comparative judgments as children may find these difficult or have different perceptions. For example, big, small, fast, slow, etc. Be sensitive to language that the child may find difficult to say. This was directly explained by the Court of Appeal in the case of Joseph Leko. This is criminal appeal number 124 of 2013. 
Here, the Court of Appeal said it is not necessary for the court to demand a question be asked that a child specifically names the sexual body part. What is important is that uh, explanation given by the child can easily make the court understand that she is referring to a certain part, to a certain body, to a certain organ that has been used. And here, we do not intend to force the child to speak when it comes to sexual languages, for instance. A child should be allowed to simply say the body part that he, he or she thinks according to the normal life of uh, living as we live, there are certain type of words we are restricted to say, even when it comes to adults. Here, the child may be allowed to simply say, uh, instead of saying specifically the word, uh, the sexual parts that we are specifically used, we would want a child to simply say, maybe he used, uh, in Kiswahili would say, he used the dudu, and the other, sometimes we would say, he did something bad to me, he, he or she should be also allowed to draw or make some certain gestures that will allow the court to know specifically that the part that she's referring to is a certain part of the organ of the body that either used him to, abu to, to, used to abuse him or where she was used to, to be abused. Explain that it is okay for the child to say, I don't know or I don't remember rather than feeling obliged to come up with an answer. Pakatoka dam. Mheshimiwa, kwa lizaa mahakama, nilikuwa naomba niondoke na mtoto mpaka kwenye ofisi yangu nikamuoji sehemu yenye ufaragha kwa sababu hapa naona hanipo ushirikiano na ameonekana amepoteza furaha. Kwa hiyo naomba nikakae mwenyewe kwenye ofisi yangu labda kuna jambo anaweza kanielezea la zaidi. Kwa mtoto anaonekana hayuko huru kuzungumza hapa. Afisa usio la jamii unapewa dakika chache za kwenda kukaa na kumwandaa mtoto ili mtakaporudi kama atakuwa na uwezo wa kuzungumza basi tutaendelea na shauri ile. Here are some examples of bad questioning. Poor practice would be to ask a question as such. Is it not true that you were not supposed to be in the school at that time? The problems with this question is that it is a double negative, it is a leading question, and has a confusing structure. The same question asked a different way would be, were you supposed to be at the school at that time? Or, where were you supposed to be at that time? Another example that illustrates poor practice is, you stole the bike, didn't you? The problems with this question is that it is aggressive and has an intimidating tone. The same question, asked a different way, would be, did you steal the bike? Age determination. In juvenile court proceedings, age determination is very important to be considered early, once disputed, because it matters in ascertaining whether the court has jurisdiction to proceed with the case or not. Section 98 of the Law of the Child Act states that the juvenile court has jurisdiction to hear and determine criminal charges against a child. That means a person below the age of 18 years is a child as provided for under Section 4, Subsection 1 of the Law of the Child Act. If a person is above 18 years of age, his case will be heard and determined in ordinary courts. If it happens that there is a dispute as to the age of a child, the court shall cause an inquiry to be made into the child's age as per Section 113 of the Law of the Child Act and Rule 12 of the Juvenile Court Rules. The inquiries may be relied on the child's birth certificate, medical evidence, information from the primary school attended by the child, any primary school leaving certificate, and any other relevant credible information or document. 
in the case of Ricasa Bernardo versus Republic, criminal appeal number 477, the Court of Appeal made it clear that before the case is being heard where the child is involved, whenever the age of the child is in dispute, it must be determined first. If the court doesn't do so and proceeds to hear the case, at the end of the day, the proceedings may be vitiated. And when the proceedings are vitiated, that means the juvenile court did not take its role of making sure that the age of the child has been determined at the earliest possible because of the dispute of the age. The law under Section 114, Subsection 2 of the Law of the Child Act states that if the court has failed to establish the correct age of the person brought before it, then the age stated by that person, parent, guardian, relative or social welfare officer shall be deemed to be the correct age of that person. Do's and don'ts. What are the do's and don'ts when handling criminal charges against a child? Here are the do's. Manage the progress of the case as per Rule 16 of the Juvenile Court Rules. Give breaks to the accused child during the hearing of the case. Since many of the children coming to court are students, ensure court proceedings do not affect their right to education. Another thing to do is acquire enough information in making considerations on bail and sentencing. Information can be obtained from a prosecutor or social inquiry report prepared by a social welfare officer. For example, when you consider bail, you must get enough information from the public prosecutor and also the social welfare officer because sometimes you might find that the citizens are not ready to tolerate the child's behavior anymore and they have promised to harm him. So, if you don't have such information, you might release him on bail and he will be harmed by the citizens. Deliver your judgment within 21 days. This is according to Rule 48, Sub-Rule 4 of the Juvenile Court Rules. And finally, after convicting a child and before passing sentence, obtain a social inquiry report from the social welfare officer within 14 days from the day of request. And here are the don'ts. Never receive the case while investigation is incomplete, save for homicide cases or cases triable by the High Court. Never stay with the case pending for more than six months without giving the verdict. With reasonable grounds to be recorded, a magistrate can extend the time for completion of the case for the period not exceeding three months. Another thing to consider, don't adjourn cases for more than 14 days. All the court personnel should not wear uniform. And finally, do not ask irrelevant or needless repetitive questions, degrading and confrontational questions in cross-examination. Social Inquiry Report Rule 46, Subrule 4 of the Juvenile Court Rules states that the court shall, after convicting the child and before passing a sentence, request a social welfare officer to prepare a social inquiry report to be filed within 14 days from the day of request made. This will help a magistrate to give a sentence which is rehabilitative to a child.
as I have foresaid, let me highlight some of the contents of the social inquiry report. The child is background, previous record, if any, whether the child goes to school or not, the possibility of reoffending, the economic status of the parents, lastly, a social welfare officer will have to recommend a proper sentence regarding the details for us stated. Sentences. Here are the sentencing principles to be considered before reaching the decision on the appropriate sentence for a convicted child. Refer to Rule 49 of the Juvenile Court Rules. Proportionality by reference to the circumstances of both the offence and the offender. The importance of rehabilitating and reintegrating child offenders. Yes, take into account the importance of rehabilitating and reintegrating a child offender as it was stated in the case of Tabufiqua. In this particular case, although it was not specifically referring to the child, but the High Court pronounced what are the best and appropriate practice through which sentencing is made. The question of proportionality was stated clear in that particular case. Tabufiqua versus Republic, Tanzania Report 1988, at page 48, in that particular case, the High Court pronounced properly the need to balance the two. That you look at the offender, you look at the offense, and you make the sentence that is proportionate and appropriate to the offense that has been committed. The need to maintain and strengthen family relationships wherever possible. The least restriction consistent with the legitimate aim of protecting victims and the community. The importance of child offenders accepting responsibility for their actions and being able to develop responsible, beneficial and socially acceptable ways. Take into account factors that have contributed to the child's offending behaviour the special circumstances of particular groups of child offenders, especially children living in difficult circumstances. The court shall, before passing sentence, take into account a. the social inquiry report, b. any plea of mitigation made by the child or made on his behalf. Most mitigation factors are provided in the inquiry report. C. The culpability of the child and the harm caused. D. That placement in an approved school should only be imposed as an exceptional measure, as a last resort for the shortest appropriate period of time. And E whether a discharge or non-custodial sentence would be in the best interest of the child and serve the interests of justice. A child shall not be sentenced to imprisonment, Section 119, Subsection 1 of the Law of the Child Act, Cap 13, Revised Edition of 2019. The following are sentences available to children offenders. Absolute discharge, as provided under Section 119, Subsection 2A of the Law of the Child Act. Repatriation order, as provided under Section 119, Subsection 2B of the Law of the Child Act. Handing over to a fit person or institution, Section 119, Subsection 2C of the Law of the Child Act. Conditional discharge, 
as supported by Rule 50 of the Juvenile Court Rules. Fine, compensation and cost is provided under Section 118 of the Law of the Child Act and supported by Rule 51 of the Juvenile Court Rules. Probation orders as provided under Section 118 of the Law of the Child Act and supported by Rule 52 of the Juvenile Court Rules. If a child breaches a non-custodial order, the prosecutor may refer the case back to the court. The court can confirm or amend the original order or choose another non-custodial order. The court is allowed to impose a custodial order, but only if the circumstances under Rule 53, Subrule 4 of the Juvenile Court Rules apply. Under Rule 54, Sub 1 of the Juvenile Court Rules, children may only be given a custodial sentence if the offence is a serious offence of violence, or a child is a persistent offender and has committed offences that would, if committed by an adult, would be punishable by a custodial sentence. And if the court believes that there is a significant risk of harm to members of the public, and here we take examples that a child to be sentenced out of this must be either a recidivist or who is a persistent offender and has committed several offenses and therefore doing so would be at the best interest of the child to be sentenced to a custodial sentence. Because as a matter of principle, a child should not be sentenced to imprisonment and therefore to derogate from that particular point, <coughs> we have taken into consideration that it is at the best interest of the child himself at the best interest of the, of the community and taking into account all circumstances that are prevailing. That's why we can now say the child should be sentenced to an approved school, which is the only sentence that is custodial. And this should be done at the last resort. And there are factors that the court should not consider. For instance, if a child has no parental care or has no guardian, that should not be taken as the reason to sentence a child to an approved school, which is the only custodial sentence that is available. But we have to also comment that the maximum sentence to be provided is three years, or until when the child reaches the age of 18. Here we are saying the approved school order is made and the child, therefore, is to be committed to prison for just three years. Now, whichever comes first, if a sentence is made, a child, before saving the whole sentence, becomes 18, he cannot go on uh, staying in the approved school. Or if it is saved after three years, then the child should be discharged. This is therefore provided for under Section 124 of the Law of the Child Act, and therefore there are information that is required to be in support of the approved school order. And here we, we say that the approved school manager may make an extension or may apply for an extension for the period that does not exceed one year, as it is already for under Section 127. And here, this should be done at the exceptional circumstances and should be made by the court. And therefore, that is the court which has to look at the circumstances before passing that particular sentence. We have also to note that a child shall not be sentenced to imprisonment as it has been specifically provided for under Section 119 of the Law of the Child Act. And we have therefore to say that basing on what is specifically stated under the law, and we have said section 119 of the Law of the Child Act, it prevents uh, giving out a child or taking out a child to imprisonment. But still, there are so many sentences that have been provided here. 
One of them includes uh, corporal punishment. But when looking at the Law of the Child Act as it is, it does not provide that a sentence of corporal punishment can be given. Why? Because under Section 13, the law says sentences that are degrading, that are inhuman, should not be imposed to a child. When looking at imposing the corporal punishment, the manner in which the corporal punishment is imposed on a child looks more or less degrading, and that's why um, the, the, the Law of the Child Act did not mention as one of the sentences as corporal punishment. That's why in the juvenile court, we discourage directly that the corporal punishment, as it is, should not be imposed on a child. That is important to note. Civil application. Ordinarily, or quite often, the juvenile court is known for dealing with the uh, criminal uh, cases. But of course, the law of the Child Act, as well as the juvenile court rules, provides room for civil application that can be made before the juvenile court rules. According to Section 98, Subsection 1, Subsection B of the Law of the Child Act, the juvenile court shall have power to hear and determine applications relating to child care, maintenance, and protection. The common civil applications which are filed in the juvenile court include applications for custody, maintenance, access, and parentage. Applications for custody, maintenance, access, and parentage are covered under Part 5 of the Law of the Child Act, Cap 13, Revised Edition of 2019, and Part 7 up to 9 of the Juvenile Court Rules. Normally, these applications are lodged in the Juvenile Court by filling Forms number 8, 7, and 6 respectively. These forms are available in the third schedule of the Juvenile Court Rules. Child Protection Applications The Child Protection Regulations Government Notice No. 11 of 2015 define a child in need of protection. Under Rule 4, Subrule 1, a child shall be regarded as being in need of care and protection if he is suffering significant harm or is at the risk of suffering significant harm and one or more of the circumstances contained in Section 16 or Section 144 of the Law of the Child Act, Cap 13, Revised Edition 2019, applies. Child protection cases which may be filed in the juvenile court include care or supervision order, search and production order, and exclusion order. These applications are lodged in the juvenile court by filling in form number 3, 5, and 10 respectively. These forms are available in the third schedule of the juvenile court rules. And upon uh, making a finding or determination in uh, matters relating to uh, juveniles, the court is duty bound to inform the parties of their right to appeal or prefer an appeal before an appellate uh, court. In conclusion, Section 130, subsection 1 of the Law of the Child Act and Rule 123 of the Juvenile Court Rules stipulates that the court shall, when a finding, sentence or order is made or passed, inform the parties that they have 14 days in which to enter their appeal. Dear participants, you have learnt about the juvenile court and its jurisdiction, the procedures for proper handling of children's cases in both aspects, when the child is in conflict with the law and when the child is in need of care and protection. Sentencing and its procedures as well as the different court orders that one may apply and be granted by the juvenile court. You may have noted that procedures of Henry cases involving children 
are quite different from the ordinary procedures obtained in cases involving adults. I therefore urge all of you to adhere to the juvenile court rules when hearing and determining cases involving children. I understand that time was not sufficient enough to cover each and every detail of the juvenile court rules and I therefore encourage you to take time and read the Law of the Child Act of 2009, the juvenile court rules, relevant developments in the law, case law, and any other literatures related to child rights and the juvenile justice in general. Thank you for listening and I hope you have enjoyed the lesson.